All right. Good morning, everybody. And uh, let me welcome you to MEI's uh, Defense Leadership Series today in its uh, 17th episode. I'm Bilal Saab. I'm the host of this uh, series, and I run the Defense and uh, Security Program at MEI. And I'm also the author of a forthcoming book called Rebuilding Arab Defense, U.S. Security Cooperation in the Middle East. I'd say almost two years ago, uh, we created the uh, Defense Leadership Series as really an excuse to speak to our old friend, uh, General Frank McKinsey, the former CENTCOM commander. And this program um, has developed quite nicely since, uh, I would say, and I'm proud of every single episode that we've done. Uh, I personally have learned a ton from all these conversations uh, with some of the most experienced and distinguished uh, voices in U.S. and also in regional Middle East uh, policy. I will submit that a couple of things that we've lacked um, in the series is a more voices from the region. And believe me, this is not for lack of trying. Okay. This is a, there's always a sensitive conversation with that part of the world, uh, but also more voices from a branch in the U S government that plays a no less instrumental role in U S foreign policy than that played by the executive branch. And I would say that is the United States Congress. Uh, today, we're going to start to fill that gap. Uh, with a conversation with uh, Congressman Mike Waltz from Florida, who has a really good bit of experience in the world of defense. Before I introduce Mike, uh, let me emphasize that over the past two years, I've had the pleasure of really hosting guests uh, with very different political leanings. Uh, some Democrats, some Republican, some nonpartisan. And the only reason why it has worked is because the conversation truly centered on policy, and of course, specifically U.S. Middle East policy. This conversation with Mike today really is no different. Um, and let me remind the audience that as an institution, all MEI really cares about, and that is its mission, it remains its mission, is increasing knowledge of the Middle East among citizens of the United States and promoting a better understanding between the people of these two areas, frankly, regardless of who's occupying the Oval Office. With that, let me introduce Congressman Mike Waltz. Mike represents Florida's sixth congressional district. He served over 24 years in the U.S. Army and is presently serving in the National Guard. After being commissioned as an Army Lieutenant, Mike became a Green Beret, serving worldwide as a decorated Special Forces officer with multiple combat tours in Afghanistan, which we're going to talk about, the Middle East, but also in Africa. For his actions in combat, Mike was awarded four Bronze Stars and two with Valor. He is the first Green Beret to be elected to Congress, and in addition to his military service, Mike is a former White House and Pentagon policy advisor, and most importantly, I would say, a proud father who very recently had a new baby boy. So congratulations, Mike. Thank you. Uh, we've got a little less than an hour, Mike. I know that we have a hard stop at 11, uh, so we're going to honor that. Um, this is an on-the-record conversation. Uh, broadcast live on YouTube and on the MEI website. I also believe that C-SPAN will be airing this live too. So with this long introduction, Mike, it's such a pleasure to have you and uh, thank you for your time. Any opening remarks? Well, you know, it's wonderful to be uh, with, with you, Bilal, and uh, thank you for the great work that MEI does. Uh, I think we absolutely, which I, I'm sure we'll get into, uh, need to keep our eye on the ball uh, when it comes to Middle East policy, when it comes to our security assistance, when it comes to the threat of global terrorism. Uh, I, I think a, a looming um, series of issues with the Iranian regime uh, and where the Middle East fits in, uh, in what I am openly calling a new Cold War uh, that the Chinese Communist Party is in uh, with the United States. So. Uh, happy to be with you. And you're right. Um, Congress can be enormously frustrating. Uh, you know, uh, there, I, I think the headlines don't tell the full story. Uh, I am proud to serve on two very bipartisan committees, the Armed Services Committee and the Science and Space and Technology uh, Committee, and have just uh, uh, stepped into a role as the ranking Republican uh, on the military committee for readiness, which means we have a responsibility for all of our bases uh, around the world, training, logistics, uh, maintenance, uh, you know, all of the things that make a military go. Uh, and those frankly are all the things that we're seeing the Russian uh, military uh, you know, flounder 
uh, with right now. So it, it's an incredibly important time. Uh, and I don't think the United States has ever faced such a diverse array of potential threats. Uh, and, and the Middle East will continue to be right, right at the heart of, of global security and stability. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to talk about all these things, Mike, but first and foremost, how's the baby? Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, you know, we were, we were able to, his name is Armand, which my, uh, my wife's family are Jordanian Christians, uh, that, that immigrated here in the fifties and, uh, in, in Arabic, Armand means hope and peace. Uh, but I'm having a lot of fun calling him army for short. Uh, and my wife is also an army veteran. Uh, and, you know, on top of our 18 year old daughter, uh, we're, we're, we're staying busy. Army's keeping us busy. We're trying to feed them and keep them, keep them uh, resupplied and ready to go. Fantastic. That's great to hear. I can't believe you pulled off the army uh, nickname, but <laughs> uh, we'll let it slide. Yeah. Um, listen, uh, just tell us very quickly, what are you working on in terms of legislation before we get into the conversation on the Middle East? Well, sure. Well, one of the great things about being on the Armed Services Committee is we have uh, an annual defense bill that's passed uh, every year for the last 61 years. Uh, so despite the, you know, the, the dysfunction that we might often wring our hands about in Washington, D.C., we come together when it comes to our national defense. Um, with I just mentioned the, the readiness subcommittee, uh, things like the major fuel depot uh, in Red Hill, um, uh, in, in, in Hawaii that fuels our Pacific fleet that's been in place since World War II has now had a series of major uh, leaks that, that have contaminated the water supply. And you know, how do we, one, uh, repair that facility, but two, disperse our logistics, uh, push them forward uh, into the Pacific uh, and, and really support the Pacific fleet uh, and support you know, potentially um, uh, the, the defense of Taiwan. So that will be, I think, a major focus this year. But more broadly, I spent a year on a supply chain task force um, and looking at how do we ensure our supply chains are secure? How do we bring many of our critical uh, manufacturing that, that's critical to our na national defense uh, capabilities back home? Or to the extent we can't bring them to the United States, how do we get them in an allied country? Uh, everything from our pharmaceuticals um, right now, the United States no longer produces antibiotics. We no longer produce 90% of our oncology medicine uh, to critical minerals like lithium, cobalt, uh, and graphite that, will, that are essential to batteries or essential to our computer chips and therefore essential to our modern economy uh, and, and our national defense. And then finally, I'm very focused on space. Uh, you can't be number one on Earth if you're number two in space. Our adversaries have developed offensive capabilities that can take our constellations down uh, that our modern economy and our military depend on. So how do we defend our assets, but also uh, put theirs at risk so we have uh, uh, deterrence um, in space? So that, amongst other things, will, be, will, will, will keep us busy this year. Fair enough. It's my new motto, Mike. Uh, what is it again? You can't be number one on Earth. You're going to be number one, number two in space. That's right. Can't be number one oh. on Earth if you're number two in space. And right now, uh, for example, the Chinese have launched more into space in the last two years than the United States and the rest of the world combined. Fair enough. Uh, so we have some catching up to do, uh, and we have to defend our supremacy in space. Copy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Let's start big picture, Mike. And uh, you got to start with the national defense strategy, right? The constitution of the Pentagon. Um, the previous one and the current one both have emphasized um, the pacing challenge, what we call the pacing challenge of China. Mm -hmm. And uh, what used to be great power competition, now we're calling it strategic competition, right? With uh, the Chinese primarily, and then to a lesser extent, the Russians. Uh, just give us your own view of where does the Middle East, uh, and you know, we're also de-emphasizing the Middle East to a certain extent. Give us your own view of where do you still see the Middle East in this uh, new equation, uh, geopolitical priorities of ours, and what kind of a role does it play in the strategic competition? Sure. Well, uh, you know, taking a step back and, and really looking at a, at a macro level, I think the existential question of this next decade, if not beyond, is how does the United States, I don't like to say keep pace, I want to say outpace uh -huh. uh, the rapid Chinese military buildup, but also deal with a still uh, 
uh, obviously very aggressive and threatening Russia. Um, a North uh, rogue regimes like North Korea and Iran, uh, as they race towards their own nuclear capabilities, uh, but still deal with global the threat of global terrorism. You know, how do we do China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, um, also secure our own hemisphere and the homeland and global terrorism uh, overlaid with 30 trillion in debt and climbing? Um, how do we do all of those things and how do we balance and prioritize? And, and just to be candid, this initial, we don't have the details yet, but this initial defense budget that came over, in my view, doesn't do the job. Uh, we just had um, hearings with the Secretary of Defense and Chairman Milley and the Pentagon's comptroller and the comptroller uh, admitted in the hearing that he used a 4% inflation figure, yet today we're seeing inflation at 8.5%. Uh, so we're going backwards uh, in terms of our buying power uh, in, our, in our defense budget. And when we're talking an $800 billion budget, uh, you know, you're talking tens of billions of dollars that the military no longer has at its disposal. Um, so that's one piece. Uh, I, I think the, the Congress needs to take some greater responsibility and get the appropriations out on time uh, when we're consistently half a year late. That delays shipbuilding. It causes uncertainty in our defense industrial base. Uh, it causes all kinds of uncertainty in terms of the Pentagon being able to plan exercises and training uh, and the things that it needs to function. Uh, so Congress has a role too in terms of doing its job uh, and, and, and getting the, the budget out uh, on time. Uh, and then finally, you know, within the priorities of, uh, of the the, the national defense strategy, you know, I worry uh, when it comes to the Middle East in particular uh, that we're taking our eye off the ball when it comes to the threat of global terrorism. Uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda, and I know you want to talk about, I think, uh, I hope, at least Afghanistan uh, in a bit, because I think it, it, it is going to come back to bite us. Um, but ISIS and Al Qaeda didn't get the memo that uh, this administration wanted the, the war on terror to be over. Uh, they still fully intend to attack us. They're developing the capabilities to do so. Um, and as we, and we should, as we shift towards um, e even further towards the Indo-Pacific, we have to put strategies and capabilities in place uh, that can still mitigate the threat from terrorism. And then, you know, I'd love to talk about what a broader strategy looks like to undermine the ideology of Islamic extremism. Uh, so that we're not playing, you know, kind of whack-a-mole um, with kinetic strikes for, you know, for future generations. Well, before we get to Afghanistan, Mike, I mean, you better than anybody else know that obviously we can't limit the Middle East to just the global war on terrorism. So just as a region, as a very vital, strategically vital region, just right. tell me a little bit more, how do you view uh, that region playing a role in this strategic competition, right? So as we de-emphasize it, others are going to step in, right, whether it's the Chinese or the Russians all sorts of massive economic flows coming in and out of that region, right? So just tell me a little bit more about that beyond the terrorism problem. Sure, well, I mean, we still have uh, the vast majority of the world's uh, global energy supplies uh, flowing uh, at, out, out of the Middle East. Um, that, uh, you know, China imports uh, about three quarters of its energy needs. Much of that comes from the Middle East, we just saw um, uh, the president have uh, the Emir of Qatar uh, in the Oval Office uh, talking about replacing uh, and working with um, not just Qatar, but Saudi Arabia and, and others um, as we try to reduce our Europe's dependency on Russian oil and gas. Where is that going to come from? Uh, right. I think the PARS uh, gas field that Qatar shares uh, with Iran is going to continue to, to play a significant role. We've seen outreach from, uh, from the president to uh, OPEC nations uh, in terms of their energy supplies. Um, and then we're going to, I think, continue to see broader cultural and, and economic reforms uh, a, a across the Gulf and across the Middle East. Um, the situation in Syria uh, remains unresolved. You literally have tens of thousands of uh, radical ISIS fighters in uh, various types of prisons uh, and refugee camps. Uh, it's a very, very precarious 
situation that frankly, no one wants to take responsibility for. Thankfully, uh, our Kurdish uh, and, and Arab and, and Syrian allies uh, are, at least for now, uh, taking responsibility for, for, you know, I don't you know, for lack of a better term, kind of keeping a lid uh, right. on, on that problem and keeping it mitigated. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to continue to see water uh, issues uh, really dominate, uh, and and we have unresolved refugee crisis from right. uh, from the Syrian conflict. Right. Uh, I am somewhat encouraged by the situation. Um, you know, it, it it's in fits and starts by the situation in Iraq. Uh, as that government continues to form. I serve as co-chair of the Kurdish uh, caucus uh, and will continue to, to uh, you know, work with the, with the various Kurdish political parties um, as, as they seek uh, to, to move their people forward. It, it's absolutely something that the United States needs to stay engaged in. And, and as I say all the time below, that doesn't mean 100,000 American boots on the ground. Sure. It means American leadership, right. um, and it means projecting you know our values yep. in terms of, of of democracy, of liberty, of uh, women's rights. I say all the time. I also serve as co-chair of the Women's Peace and Security Caucus. Um, that you know, girls' education and women's empowerment can't just be this kind of nice to have human rights issue, it's a national security issue. If you look in societies where girls are educated, where women thrive, you don't tend to have an overwhelming extremism problem. Where women thrive in civil society and education and business and in, in politics, um, it has uh, a very moderating influence, I think, on, on that country's civil society and on their future. And finally, people ask me all the time, as someone who my entire adult life now has been dominated by the war on terror. Right. They said, what does victory look like? We've killed al-Baghdadi. We've killed Osama bin Laden. Um, I, I think we'll continue to have to fight those radical elements. But victory to me looks like women thriving in Tehran, uh, women thriving in Riyadh, in, in Damascus, um, and those societies moving, uh, moving forward in ways that cares uh, for all of all of their people. And we look at, you know, you look at the trajectory of communism. We used to have communist back terrorist groups that were attacking discos and, and, and uh, airliners uh, all over the world. But why can't they recruit anymore? They can't recruit anymore because the ideology is now right. largely defunct. So how do, we, uh, how do we really move to that war of ideas uh, and, um, and win that war of ideas when it comes to extremism? That's the broader effort that I think is somewhat lacking in our defense strategy and our broader strategy. Fair enough. Okay. And thank you for that overview, uh, Mike. Well, why don't we just talk about that? Uh, what used to be, or maybe still is, I don't know, the epicenter of global terrorism, which is uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, right? And so you've served in that country. Um, and uh, you know that we um, are no longer there, obviously, perhaps the most visible manifestation uh, of our reduced involvement in the Middle East is um, our withdrawal from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, how do you evaluate that decision to withdraw? Uh, what are some of the costs? What are some, some of the benefits? Recognizing, of course, for those who are less familiar, that we spent a good 20 years in that country. Uh, yeah. It's not like we withdrew you know, after a couple of years. So just an overall strategic assessment of that decision to withdraw uh, beyond the messy you know, uh, withdrawal itself, logistical and what have you. But just the strategic decision itself. Right. Well, I mean, to we, we just had, um, you, you mentioned General McKenzie, the former CENTCOM commander. His last hearing was just a few weeks ago. Right. Uh, and he reaffirmed, uh, you know, as an answer to one of my questions, uh, that his best military advice to President Biden was to leave a small force um, and to keep Bagram Air Base, to continue to bolster the, the far from perfect um, but democratically elected Afghan government, uh, and, and, and not to have American soldiers out there necessarily pulling triggers in active combat, but providing the maintenance, the logistics, the intelligence, that kind of back-end support to the Afghan army as they were, uh, as, you know, as they were fighting the fights that, that they were engaged in. Uh, and so I think going to zero uh, is a decision we will regret. 
Uh, I think the way the withdrawal was conducted, I have to tell you just as an American, as a veteran, that will be a moral stain uh, on this country's consciousness and history uh, for, um, for you know, the foreseeable future. I am still getting um, streams of messages uh, from Americans that were left behind, from our allies that were left behind, uh, for former members of the Afghan military that are being hunted down right now as we speak. Uh, and uh, we, we have a moral obligation uh, for, to stand with those that stood with us uh, and that stood with what our flag represents and what their future represented. Uh, and we've seen now uh, that the Taliban have backtracked on their promises Girls are no longer allowed to attend school. Uh, they are absolutely hunting down those that worked with the previous government. Uh, and what I fear we have now is essentially a terrorist super state. I mean, we saw what happened in the wake of the full withdrawal from Iraq uh, with the rise of ISIS that morphed from Al Qaeda and right. ISIS caliphate the size of Austria uh, that we had to go back to deal with. Right. Here's my concern, Bilal, here's my real fear. We are going to have to go back to deal with ISIS and Al-Qaeda that, as we speak, are developing the capability to strike the West again and fully intend to do so mm -hmm. under the umbrella of the uh, Taliban government. Uh, but the difference when we had to go back to clean up uh, the mess of the ISIS caliphate versus the Taliban caliphate was that in the Middle East, in the Gulf, we had bases in Turkey and in Jordan and in Northern Iraq and in Israel uh, and, and around the region, we had local allies in the Kurds. We still had a functioning uh, government in Baghdad uh, to, to deal with. And we had uh, access from the ocean. In Afghanistan, we have no bases, no local allies, very limited access from the ocean. It is uh, a far more difficult situation and future American intelligence uh, uh, officers and, and special operations officers uh, are, are going to have to, I fear, are, are going to have to deal with this in the future. And then finally, I'm very worried about Pakistan. Uh, you know, I, I, I tell groups all the time that I'm talking to in my district, we look at how we've struggled with Iraq, population 25 million, Afghanistan, population 30 million. Pakistan population 210 million plus a nuclear arsenal. Uh, and uh, if that uh, country destabilizes, we have, uh, we have a real serious situation on our hands. Uh, and I fear with that the first place that the, the, the ramifications of the withdrawal from Afghanistan will be felt uh, is in the Kashmir, is in India, uh, it, you know, the Haqqani Network, the Taliban, Lashkar-e Taiba, half the world's terrorist organizations exist in that border region. And yes. we are incredibly limited in our ability uh, to, one, from an intelligence stand, uh, standpoint, understand what's going on, but two, uh, to deal with it. I don't know if you were tracking, Mike, just before, just because we, um, before we uh, went on live, uh, I heard there was a security incident in New York City, and uh, it's too soon to tell what really happened, whether it's an accident or a terrorist attack, but certainly uh, concerning. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about another big challenge, um, and um, this one uh, relates to Iran. So, the, as you know, the United States has been involved in talks with that country over its uh, nuclear program, and those talks have been indirect, right, in uh, Europe. Uh, just your own views on this uh, process. Um, anything you would recommend that we do differently uh, when it comes to what the Department of Defense sees as the number one threat in the region? I mean, you mentioned General McKinsey and his testimony. I think he was pretty explicit about that. Um, and uh, just on top of that, I know that's three questions. Um, was there any good in the previous administration's maximum pressure policy? Well, if you look at it, we'll just go backwards there. I mean, if you look at the maximum uh, pressure campaign, and I know this is, there's a lot of debate out there about how effective or not effective um, and the withdrawal from the JCPOA uh, and, 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 and where the previous administration went. But I look at a, a couple of metrics. Um, you know, the thing the regime in Iran cares about the most, sadly, is not its own people, is its wallet. Uh, is you know the vast business empire that uh, the IRGC is behind, 
um, you know, the vast empire that the, that the regime is behind uh, uh, financially, uh, that was truly uh, under threat under the maximum pressure campaign. We saw uh, the Iranian currency tanking. Um, uh, we saw their foreign reserves at record low. Uh, their exports of oil uh, had dropped from about 4 million barrels per day to, to less than 400,000. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think they were absolutely treading water uh, to see how the 2020 election went. Um, and many analysts that I spoke to that were watching this very closely were confident that had we kept the maximum pressure campaign in place, the Iranian regime would have come back to the table uh, from a position of weakness uh, and, uh, and I think would have been open to a much broader deal and more comprehensive deal uh, than the um, uh, than the JCPOA covered, and one of the primary metrics that I looked at is many of its terrorist proxies uh, were not getting paid uh, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, uh, and even in Yemen. Uh, they were struggling financially because the regime uh, literally didn't have the cash flows to help them uh, pay their terrorist payroll. Uh, so, so that's I, I think what. The, um, what the administration, this new administration, the Biden administration inherited. But at the same time, uh, the, the regime was starting to put the pieces in place to go back to enrichment. Um, I led a bipartisan letter at the beginning of the Biden administration, uh, had over 70, uh, this was really significant, but all 70 Democrats and 70 Republicans, 140 uh, members of Congress that said any future deal needed to not just encompass enrichment, but also had to encompass weaponization right. because there's three components to a, to, a, to a bomb, right? There's the enrichment, there's the weaponization, uh, and then there's the ballistic missile program. Had to have all three of those, but also address uh, Iran's support for terrorism. It is still listed by the State Department as the largest uh, and most significant backer of terrorism around the world, uh, but also our hostages as well in its hostage diplomacy. Sadly, uh, there is still a, uh, a US citizen, uh, Samiak Namazi, uh, that was supposed to have been released uh, with the signing of the JCPOA. Uh, uh, then Secretary of State Kerry was promised uh, by Zarif that he would be released along with the others that were released. He's still sitting in Evan prison to this day. Uh, and that is unconscionable. His poor 80-plus-year-old uh, father, Babak Namazi, traveled over to try to talk some sense in the regime. They took him hostage, uh, not to mention two others, uh, American citizens that are literally chained to the floor of the prison. Uh, so just I should have started with them because I don't think we should be having any talks uh, with any regime that's holding Americans hostage. To me, that is a precondition. Uh, if anyone is serious about diplomacy with the United States of America, you don't hold uh, our citizens um, uh, uh, hostage in, you know, uh, unlawfully and illegally. So that, that's where we are. Um, unfortunately, the same team that was around President Obama is now around uh, uh, Biden. Uh, and I think they're heading down the same road, uh, you know, as has been widely reported in the press. The Iranians uh, refuse to even speak with us. So we're using uh, European nations plus Russia plus China as go-betweens. I have huge issue uh, with, with that construct, um, uh, especially with what's going on in Ukraine. I don't see how we can look to the Russians to be honest brokers. And they really showed their cards a couple of weeks ago when they demanded carve outs uh, for the sanctions that were in uh, that were in place because of the atrocities in Ukraine, uh, the carve outs for Russia through the Iran deal. I think they've since backtracked on that. Um, but look, at the end of the day, uh, it, it is, I think, clear and from everybody I'm talking to that the administration wants a deal so badly uh, that uh, that I, I really fear for what's going to come out of uh, of these negotiations. And, and finally, you know, something I'm really watching, and then if you have some follow-in blog, I know I'm going on long here, but oh, you're good. Go ahead. something, I, something I'm, I'm really watching are, are reports of what's called inherent guarantees. Uh, and that's essentially the Iranian regime 
uh, fears that a future administration will tear up a deal. And this is the important distinction between an executive order uh, and the administration basically doing this on their own and coming to Congress and crafting a deal that would pass uh, for a treaty, which would then you know, essentially have the force, have the force of law. So the Iranian regime uh, knows the administration isn't going to bring this to Congress in a meaningful way. They fear a future uh, administration could tear up the deal. So what they're asking for are inherent guarantees from the Biden negotiators uh, that um, if any future administration you know, decides this is bad for America's national security, bad for global, global stability and, and walks away from it, that they can immediately go back to advanced centrifuges and immediately go back uh, to enrichment. I have a real issue with that. Uh, one, from a constitutional standpoint of not coming to Congress, uh, uh, not abiding by laws that demand that any Iran deal come to Congress, but then tying a future administration's hand, trying to tie a future administration's hands. And then also it puts Russia uh, a, a bit in the catbird seat um, as the judge and jury, because if the enriched uranium goes to Russia uh, and, and there's an understanding that uh, they can send it back uh, to Iran, uh, if either they or the Iranians disagree with how the deal unfolds, then that basically makes Putin judge and jury. Uh, and, and I have issue with that as well. So as you can tell, I have a lot of concerns uh, and, and, and there's bipartisan concerns across the Congress. Uh, Fermi. Democrat and Republican with how this is unfolding. Fermi. Uh Mike, just to be clear on one point you made. So uh, you're not in favor of the current construct, which is indirect talks, right? We're not talking directly to the Iranians. So would you actually prefer that we talk to them directly? Because I heard you say before that I don't even want to talk to them at all since they're holding U.S. hostages. Well, to the extent you are going to talk to them, let's not use Russia and China as intermediaries. Fermi. Right. Number okay. one, two. Yeah, I, I do not favor any talks uh, with with uh, with whether it's North Korea, Iran, or we could go down the list. The Maduro regime that is actively using hostage diplomacy, the Taliban, too, for that matter, uh, which has held a Navy veteran, Mark Frerichs, through the entire withdrawal, through the signing of the Doha agreement. He should have been released uh, uh, months ago. So just as a just as a principle of diplomacy. Uh, I have I have issue with engaging and making cons any type of concession to a regime that's that's holding Copy. a gun to the head of American citizens. Copy. OK, people logged in to hear your views, Mike. So I'm going to refrain from saying anything I feel about those things, because, frankly, it doesn't matter at this point. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I think I know the answer already, Mike. So but I'm just going to ask you anyway. What do you stand on the possibility of removing the uh, IRGC, which is the uh, elite uh, branch of the Iranian military, from the foreign terrorist organization list? The administration is holding firm for now, right? So it's not like it's happening. But just you personally, how do you, uh, what's your stance on this? Well, just for those who may not be familiar, I mean, the IRGC during the Iraq war, through its external uh, entity called the Quds Force, uh, is responsible, and this has been verified uh, through multiple studies and by the State Department, is responsible for the deaths of over 600 Americans. Right. Uh, uh, I mean, so, so this isn't, you know, something that's kind of over there. Um, there are 600 Gold Star families uh, that, uh, that are not with their loved ones. And we can, that's not a, an indictment or debate on the merits of the Iraq war. At the end of the day, uh, the Iranian regime uh, deployed um, advanced IEDs and deployed its intelligence officers to kill Americans. Uh, so, so that's point one. Uh, but, but even further, I mean, they are responsible for untold deaths across Syria and atrocities uh, in, in Syria. Uh, they are responsible as we speak. Um, the Houthis are launching advanced precision guided drones and attacks on civilian infrastructure, on, uh, on the Abu Dhabi airport, on gas refineries. We can, we can walk down that list. The Houthis didn't build those and train on those by themselves. They were, they were supplied by the, by the Iranian regime through the IRGC and through the Quds Force. So right. their support of terrorism is active and ongoing. I yep. would vehemently uh, oppose removing them from uh, from the FTO from the foreign as as a foreign terrorist organization right. and importantly the chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, Mark Milley just said in a hearing last week that they are a terrorist organization they're conducting terrorist 
um, activities uh, right. as we speak, and they shouldn't be removed. Yeah, yeah. And I think, as you said yourself, a growing number of uh, Democratic congressmen uh, are also opposed to removing the RGC from the FCO list. And it seems to be now the sticking point in the negotiations. Okay, um, I'm going to throw another challenge at you, Mike, because uh, I know you can handle it. So our relationship with Saudi Arabia has reached a very low point, yeah. probably the lowest in the history of that relationship. Uh, the president doesn't want to personally uh, reach out to the crown prince, the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, that's uh, Hamad bin Salman, because let's be candid, there will be political costs for doing so. Uh, the Saudi crown prince himself doesn't want to increase oil output because uh, of his country's obligations toward the OPEC plus, but also because he feels slighted by this administration, uh, rightly or wrongly. How can we better manage this critical relationship? Well, as you well know, Bilal, and in my time, um, you know, working in uh, the UAE and Kuwait and across Afghanistan, I mean, relationships at the head of state level really matter. Um, uh, it, it matters around the world, but it particularly matters in my experience in the Middle East. Uh, and when, you know, when now you know, President Biden as candidate Biden openly um, and very strongly disparaged uh, the kingdom, uh, that doesn't that doesn't put the relationship off uh, uh, on a good foot. Um, I, you know, I, I just met with uh, the the ambassador from Saudi Arabia, first female uh, Saudi ambassador. Uh, I think she's taking a very forward looking view um, in 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 and really trying to manage this relationship. Uh, I think one of the things that we should be looking for more broadly, but where, Saud where the Saudis could be a, a leader, uh, is reviving the GCC dialogue uh, that is really, um, uh, you know, really atrophied uh, with the ongoing dispute between Qatar, uh, UAE, and, um, and the kingdom. I think the United States can have an important role there. Uh, in, in reviving that diet, that security dialogue in particular. I mean, it's broader than just security issues, but um, you know, some people have, have described it as a future kind of Gulf NATO. I don't ever see, um, I don't ever see it moving towards, uh, well, it, I don't wanna say never, but I think it would be a long time to move towards an article five types construct, right. but getting, you know, the United States should never underestimate its role as a convener sure. uh, and as a leader uh, and getting um, our Gulf allies back to the table again to talk about the broader security orchestra, uh, archi uh, um, uh, architecture. architecture, particularly as Iran uh, continues to support t uh, terrorism around uh, the region. Uh, and one way or another uh, is putting the pieces in place to have a nuclear uh, capability. And, and for those, um, I think it's always worth reminding, I say this in all of my town halls, you know, kind of bringing it home to Floridians and, and, and everyday Americans who may not be as deep in these issues um, as, as many of your folks at MEI. Why does that matter to the United States? Well, I'm convinced uh, if Tehran gets a, 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 a nuclear capability, uh, the Saudis uh, will respond in kind, the Emiratis will respond in kind, the Turks uh, will respond in kind and having a nuclear arms race in the Middle East um, uh, <laughs> should be incredibly concerning uh, for, for, for every American. So our leadership uh, and those relationships uh, need to be repaired. They matter. Uh, that doesn't mean we just turn a blind eye to human rights. Uh, I have been very vocal on human rights and women's rights and that the kingdom uh, needs to continue to make progress there and needs to move forward. Uh, and we need to have very uh, candid and frank conversations uh, when the, you know, they believe they're moving in a direction that's not in line with our values. Fair but uh, the relationship is important and we have to maintain it. Copy. Well, you, you've talked about improved dialogue, right? With these partners. Um, uh, and uh, and you've heard you've heard about the grievances, right? And the complaints about our reduced commitment to these partners' security commitment, right? And let's also be candid: some of it legitimate, some of it inflated. Uh, but just because of the nature of the relationship, you got a senior partner, and they're going to get a junior partner, and there's always going to be imbalance when it comes to uh, shared interests. Um, 
and expectations, right? Uh, what you expect from the United States. But just tell me very briefly, what do you think is really realistic and what is unrealistic when it comes to upgrading these security ties that you just talked about? Well, the, you know, the, the ties really center around the dialogues that we have, as you just mentioned, but it also, it centers around our security assistance. Okay. Um, you know, we have uh, a military uh, that in many ways is, it's not just about selling things uh, to our Middle East partners. It's about being interoperable with them. Uh, and, uh, and, and that means we have American fighter jets that are flying alongside Saudi or Emirati fighter jets. We saw this in the coalition against ISIS. Right. Um, they can talk to each other. They have, uh, they understand each other's capabilities. They've trained together. Um, and and it, it's incredibly important that that continues. Uh, Congress and sometimes uh, the State Department can really frustrate our allies with that you know, foreign military sales process uh, to the point where European companies put in their advertisement buy our stuff because you don't have to deal with the American export um, uh, regime and, and, and construct. So there's always reforms uh, sure. that we can make there um, and make that better. And I think that's absolutely realistic. Uh, um, you know, I think what's longer term just to, to manage our expectations are those broader societal reforms yeah. uh, and, and economic reforms. I think the intent and the trajectory is in the right direction. We can always debate whether it's fast enough. But at the end of the day, if we drive these allies away, um, the Chinese Communist Party is standing right there with its Belt and Road Initiative, uh, yes. with its capital, with its increasing military capabilities. Uh, and, and I don't think that's something that's good for, uh, for, for the West or good for, um, for our Gulf allies. Copy. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you're closely monitoring the situation in uh, Ukraine, which keeps getting worse and worse, right? Uh, with news, I think, Mariupol now falling. Uh, what lessons can be drawn from that war that are relevant to the Middle East and our partners uh, there? Well, I think we need, to, we need to take a hard look and a wide-eyed look at our deterrence strategy. Uh, deterrence failed in Ukraine. And uh, we need to, I don't mean that to sound partisan at all. Uh, there's a concept of integrated deterrence. It's in our national defense strategy that the administration sure. right. just released. Um, and we just, we, we can't use this broader, more holistic de um, deterrence strategy, which I agree with, uh, that is diplomatic, economic, informational, but we can't use that as an excuse to kind of slide away from hard power. Uh, these dictatorial autocratic regimes will push and push and push until they make steel. Uh, and we need to be very clear at where they're going to meet that steel and meet that hard power. Right. Uh, I was in Ukraine last year and th they were practically begging mm -hmm. uh, for anti-ship missiles. They didn't receive them for Stinger anti-air missiles. They didn't receive them. And for other types of more sophisticated weaponry, uh, and their frustration was they were continually hearing from the White House that it would be too provocative, that it would be too escalatory, uh, that the White House's focus was on diplomatic solutions. Uh, and, you know, the Ukrainians staring down uh, the barrel of the barrels of Putin's tanks, uh, I think, saw what was coming and knew that they were going to need that weaponry to, one, deter Putin, but two, uh, to, to be able to frustrate his aims and turn themselves into that, you know, we hear the analogy of turning yourself into a porcupine, too difficult to swallow. So I fear when it comes to Taiwan that we're going to take that same approach of really kind of trickling in our assistance to the Taiwanese, uh, very measured approaches out of fear of, uh, of that, those arms and that assistance being too escalatory, of provoking Z. Uh, and, and once again, we'll provide uh, them the space uh, to, to achieve by force what, what they haven't been able to achieve politically or, or diplomatically. Well, apply so all this, Mike, that to the diplomatic, that, that deterrent strategy, first and foremost, needs, we need a hard look and we need to apply it when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. Copy. Okay, well, help me apply all this to the Middle East now, recognizing that we don't have just like in Ukraine, right? We don't have any alliances in the re in the region. We have partnerships, right? Which means right. we're not legally committed to their defense. Uh, but you know, as you described very accurately the situation in Ukraine, just tell me 
what kind of connections do you see, uh, philosophical, strategic, military, you name it, to our partners in the Middle East? Yeah, well, I think, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, in, in this debate of how we respond to Ukraine, uh, I, I've heard people say, look, look what we did in the first Gulf War when we right. went and kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Right. Uh, we took action. We put American boots on the ground. We decided that was in our interest, uh, that we cannot have a global order uh, where countries can just decide they want to take and invade another country. Uh, that's what we've established post-World War II. Uh, and with American leadership, we have to maintain. So the difference is, is that, uh, is that Russia obviously has a nuclear umbrella and has a nuclear deterrent. Uh, obviously, uh, Saddam Hussein did not have that. Uh, we were able to take much bolder action. But where it really applies is if the Iranian regime right. gets uh, a, a nuclear capability. And I, I deliberately say capability, not just the fissile material, That's but right. the weaponization and the missiles yeah. to deliver it. Yeah. Uh, then they will have that umbrella and they will have that deterrent to further their aims at regional uh, hegemony. And so uh, that's why uh, it is absolutely vital uh, that we prevent uh, the Iranian regime from achieving that capability, uh, because I fear that uh, their aggressive aims uh, will be off to the races if they have uh, a nuclear umbrella, some, e even, even a fraction of what uh, Putin has. I think you mentioned it in passing, Congressman. Uh, you said that last year you visited Ukraine? I did. Tell, I did. tell us a little bit more about what you did over there. Who did you meet with? Who did you talk to? Sure. We visited uh, the Ukrainian Special Operations Command. That's really been the focus. Uh, you, you mentioned in my bio, I'm a Green Beret. The, what Green Berets focus on is training, actually. Uh -huh. uh, we can do the door kicking and the, and the, the raids, the Osama bin Laden type raids in the middle of the night. But really, our focus is training our allies, whether that be a local tribe or an allied military, on, on how, to, how to fight and defend themselves more effectively. I think what you're seeing in the Ukrainian resistance right now, to a large part, is a result of uh, years and years, eight years of uh, Green Berets training them there. Uh, we also visited with the Florida National Guard, which was conducting the kind of the more conventional training. Uh, in terms of how to use the basics of how to use the Javelin anti-tank system, first aid, tactics, command and control. Uh, so we visited with them and then it, with, a, with our embassy and with Ukrainian ministries. Uh, and their message then was give us, please, please get, we will do the fighting. We don't, we're not asking for American or NATO boots on the ground, but please give us the weapons and the resources uh, to, to defend our freedoms. Uh, and it was enormously frustrating, disappointing that they didn't get them. Uh, since then, the NATO commander uh, and General Milley, the chairman, have agreed that they would have been far better off if they had had stingers uh, with the training on day one, not a week after the invasion. Uh, they still don't have the anti-ship missiles to defend their ports. Um, you know, <laughs> they are, and they were loud and proud about it. They are willing to fight uh, this, this just demonic almost uh, Putin regime right. um, and the atrocities that they knew. They knew the Russian way of war. We've seen it in Syria. We've seen it in Chechnya. We saw it in Afghanistan in the 80s. Uh, they, they really kind of had a sense, their military uh, had a sense of what was coming and they were just begging for the arms, the ammunition to, to fight not just for their freedom, I think for, for many Europeans and the West uh, freedoms as well. God. Okay. I've got a couple more questions, Mike, and I sure. promise I will let you go before no 11 o'clock, just a little bit. Um, I had a chance to read your book several years ago, Mike, and it was such a fascinating read, and I strongly recommend it for those who haven't uh, had a chance to read it. There's a whole passage um, where you talk about you uh, working alongside Emirati forces in Afghanistan. Yeah. Just what are the main lessons from that experience, uh, the way you see it? And why, why does that matter? Well, first, I, you know, I want to give the, the Emiratis credit um, for really standing with us in so many areas of the world. I mean, people don't realize uh, the Emiratis were with us in Bosnia and Somalia, um, in Afghanistan as one of our earliest partners after 9-11. Uh, after uh, and I was embedded with Again, back to you know what Green Berets really specialize in 
it was me and just two other Green Berets embedded with an Emirati task force, partnered with an Afghan uh, uh, task force. And I have to tell you, sit the military piece aside, the message when we would go into um, Afghan villages, uh, many who hadn't seen an, a, really a, anybody outside of their region since right. the Russians uh, in the 1980s. Right. But when we would go in and an Emirati officer yeah. would, would say, look at what the United States has done uh, around the world. Look what it did for Japan, which was its former enemy. Look what it did in Germany. Look what it's done in the Philippines. Um, look what it's trying to do here. Uh, it was a incredibly powerful message. And then they would say, look, look at, um, look at Istanbul, look at Dubai. You know, we, we can be um, followers of, of Allah. We can be, uh, you know, stringent, strong Muslims uh, and followers of our faith, but still have a, a better future for uh, our children and our grandchildren. Uh, and, and to have that message undermining what they were getting from the Taliban, uh, from Al Qaeda, from ISIS elements, uh, I would take that message standing with an Afghan officer, with me, with an Emirati officer, uh, more, than a, more than a division of soldiers, because they really truly spoke to hearts and minds and turned uh, whole villages and valleys. So uh, I thought that was um, in, an incredibly powerful experience to, to have alongside them. Yeah, feels like this very uh, invaluable experience was like a long, long time ago, given the very and, tense relations right now. Between Bilal, if I could add one more thing, you sure. know, there, there's a lot of hand wringing over the fact that uh, we were there uh, for 20 years. And I get that. I wrote a whole book, as you mentioned, Warrior Diplomat, on the mistakes that we made that I experienced in the Pentagon and the Bush White House and out on the ground as a Green Beret. A lot of things we could have done better. Uh, but just because it was hard and difficult does not mean we can afford to just walk away and wish the problem away. And right. I would point out in, in areas around the world where the United States is engaged, I'm not talking hundreds of thousands of boots on the ground, sure. just an engagement and leadership. If you look at South Korea, in the 1950s, the South Korean army had a higher illiteracy rate than the Afghan army. Uh -huh. uh, it, it, it was devastated after years of Japanese occupation, no economy to speak of, no military to speak of, no infrastructure to speak of. Uh, and yet we were there for set, have been there and are still there for 70 years sure. and look where they are today. Uh, uh -huh. so, so that's a point I would make. And then also, you know, I mentioned supply chains that I'm working on. Uh, you know, Afghanistan is sitting on top of the world's third largest known copper reserves, second largest known lithium reserves, which forms the batteries, you know, for our green uh, uh, future and a green um, a new deal. Uh, cobalt, chromite, they have tremendous potential that uh, I feel like we, we never fully uh, helped them realize. Now we have China, uh, Chinese Communist Party survey teams sitting at Bagram Air Base, uh, which by the way, was only a few hundred miles from the Chinese border. Sure. Uh, I, I just think this is a tremendous strategic mistake and completely walking away. Uh, that's gonna be felt for, for generations. Okay, a bit more about China in the final uh, couple of minutes. So uh, you know that the Chinese and the Russians are making further inroads into the Middle East. Uh, I think I know the answer already, but I want to hear more from you. How worried are you about this uh, trend and about this uh, retrenchment of U.S. influence and U.S. leadership? Well, look, if, if these uh, global sanctions stay in place on uh, Russia's economy, and I do say if, because I fear uh, some, some of our European partners may backslide into old habits in terms of their dependency, but if they stay into place, it, it will over time be crippling. Uh, and Putin could find himself a junior partner to Xi. Um, we're also seeing Chinese banks uh, and state-owned enterprises see a buying opportunity uh, in, uh, in distressed Russian mines, uh, mineral producers and refiners, their oil and gas industry. Uh, in the run-up to the Olympics, uh, China and Russia signed the West Siberian gas deal, uh, which pulls from the same gas fields as, uh, as European gas. So I think you're seeing China shore up its supply chains sure. uh, so that they aren't vulnerable by sea, particularly when it comes to oil and gas, they could come over land through Mongolia rather than through the Indian Ocean 
where we could put them at risk or the Indian Navy could put them at risk uh, if we do go to some type of conflict over Taiwan. So uh, I, I think that relationship is there to stay. Uh, you're going to see the Chinese um, say the right things as it comes to Ukraine. But at the end of the day, um, you know, they want to kind of shore up their overland uh, supply chains to continue feeding their economic growth. And they see a tremendous opportunity. I think, to, to be blunt, Z sees an opportunity to put Putin in his pocket um, and create dependencies there uh, 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 across the board. Copy. Mike, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, any final words, uh, my friend? Well, no, I just want to, again, I want to thank you for the work you're doing. I look forward to the release of your book. Uh, and, uh, and, and thank you so much for uh, what MEI does. I think it brings a balanced approach to the region uh, in, in, in many ways. Um, and, and listen, from a terrorism standpoint, uh, I don't want to wait until we have the next San Bernardino, uh, uh, the, the next Pulse nightclub, which is right on the edge of my district, or God forbid, the next 9-11. Uh, we, that, there is, you know, it's, it's a war of ideas of ideology uh, and not just a, 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 a economic, diplomatic, it's not just a, a military standpoint, but the, our, our interests in the regions are far and wide. And I can tell you from a congressional standpoint, um, uh, I'll absolutely be engaged and happy to help uh, in any way that, uh, that you need. And I'll just say MEI really um, almost serves in some ways as an extension of my legislative staff uh, to be able to reach out uh, and, and, and really draw on your expertise that, that, that you all bring uh, is incredibly important. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to say that and thank you for it. We're grateful for that, Mike. Uh, I want to wish you the best of luck with legislation. Uh, doors open, you come back whenever you want. So uh, congratulations also with the baby and uh, take care of yourself.